Well, happy Mother's Day from me to you. My name's Dave, one of the pastors here. So glad to worship with you together on this special uh, Sunday. We're going through a sermon series here here at Millington through one of the books of the Bible called the Book of Hebrews. And so if you have a copy of God's Word, you can open that. We'll also have the verses on the screen for you as you can follow along. And let me begin the message today with a question. And the question goes like this. Whatever happened to Susan Pevensey? You might remember her as one of the main characters in the Chronicles of Narnia series. Susan, Queen Susan. She was the second born of the Pevensey children after Peter. She was the oldest sister. Uh, She was known to the Narnians as Queen Susan the Gentle and was uh, known to be logical to the point of being stubborn at times, motherly and much more serious than her younger sister Lucy, poor old Lou. During her reign at at the Narnian capital of Caer Paravel, she was famed for her graciousness and her incredible archery skills. They uh, called her Queen Susan of the Horn. Uh, There she developed a special connection with Aslan, the lion, noticing things like his depression and witnessing his death and resurrection and even helping him to free the witch's victims. Unfortunately, during the Pevensey siblings' second visit to Narnia, Susan demonstrated indications that she had trouble believing in magic. She was the last of the children to believe and see Aslan during the nighttime hike to Aslan's How, and when she finally did see him, he told her that she had been, quote, listening to her fears, unquote, and he tried to comfort her. Once she was back on earth, however, she began to convince herself that Narnia was just a game, Because of the fun that they had there, she thought that her siblings were being so silly to continue entertaining such childhood fantasies. And in the last scene of the final book, The Last Battle, while they're in Aslan's country, a place that represents heaven, the other kids and we the readers realize for the very first time that Susan is not there. Some of the other characters ask why Susan is not in glory with the rest of them. And that's when C.S. Lewis penned these famous words. My sister Susan, answered Peter shortly and gravely, is no longer a friend of Narnia. Is no longer a friend of Narnia. What a haunting sentence. Susan at one time seemed to be a follower of Aslan, but she ended up turning away. This fictional scene raises a very important issue we have to ask in our Christian faith. When we get to glory, could there be people not there that we were expecting to see but will not see? Let me just ask you a few basic questions. Answer them in your own mind. If you enroll as a freshman in college, take a bunch of classes, but then drop out in the middle of your sophomore year, never to return, will you still graduate? If your football team is up with a 21-point lead at halftime, but when you go into the locker room, you decide with your friends you're going to forfeit the rest of the game, do you still get the win? If you've decided to take Dave Ramsey's FPU and pay down your debt, but you only pay down 50% of what you owe and then stop, will you be debt free? If you're on a road trip to Disney World from New Jersey and on your way you stop in North Carolina at a hotel, but in the morning you do not get back into your car and continue on to Orlando, are you going to make it to your final destination? And if you begin a journey of faith in the Lord Jesus, and stop. Are you going to make it to God's heavenly rest? Please turn with me to Hebrews chapter 5. As the author answers that haunting question. This is one of the most difficult passages in the New Testament, if not the most difficult passage. Here the author gives us the third warning in the book of Hebrews. These warnings you see on the screen are going to get progressively more and more serious. Today is the warning about dullness. It involves calling into question the very salvation and genuineness of the faith of some of the 
readers. It's a very serious warning. And so in our passage, we're going to see, I believe, three different characters, three different categories of people in their church and in any church. And they are, first of all, the milk drinkers, second of all, the meat eaters, and third, the mask wearers. Not to be confused of the masks that you're wearing right now. What I mean is counterfeit Christians. The milk drinkers, immature Christians, the meat eaters, mature Christians, and then the mask wearers, the counterfeit Christians, those who are not true believers. Those three categories of people are in every church. And so the question we have to ask ourselves as we approach God's holy and inspired word is, which one am I? What are the marks of spiritual immaturity and what are the marks of spiritual maturity? And what is the difference especially between category one and category number three? Because that is where the author is issuing his warning. He is saying, some of you, I'm not sure if you're in category one or category three and that is very concerning to him because they look very similar. So that's our challenge today, and as you can tell, it's a steep challenge, so why don't we pray for the Lord's help. God, as we think about your word, we are mindful of the fact that this is not a book written by a mere human being, but that your Holy Spirit inspired this text and preserved it so that we could actually read this wonderful sermon, this letter in our day today. Now, would you now do what only you can do? Open up our ears. Open up our spiritual hearts, our spiritual eyes. Only you can do that. And we ask, God, that the, that the words of this preacher's mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts would be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Character number one, the milk drinkers. Chapter five, verse 11 begins like this. We have much to say about this, but it is hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. I'm reading the NIV here. You might remember... Uh, that last week the writer had begun to, a discussion about the high priest of Melchizedek. And uh, wanting to dive more deeply into that amazing subject of this king that's also a priest, Melchizedek, and the amazing truth that's involved there, the writer pauses for a moment before he dives deeper and says, I'm actually really concerned about you. So in a kind of parenthesis, the author says, Can I just mention that you're not really maturing as quickly as I hoped that you would be maturing. You're no longer trying to even understand. Your your translation may say, you are dull of hearing. The word there for dull or for not trying to understand is the Greek word for sluggish or lazy. It's translated lazy in chapter 6 and verse 12. And these are the characteristics of somebody who's spiritually immature. They are dull of hearing. And so the first observation about the milk drinkers is that they don't listen well. Their lack of spiritual growth and this, uh, this ignorance about this subject is not because it is too hard for them to understand. It is because there is an unwillingness to listen and an unwillingness to learn. They are lazy in their learning. You ever have a conversation with someone and they do all of the talking? They, they do 100% of the talking and you may start to wonder, do they even realize they're doing 100% of the talking in this conversation? There's very little listening on their part. That can happen in a spiritual sense here, even with spiritual leadership or with God's word. Milk drinkers never stop to take in and understand a perspective other than their own. They do not listen. They're not interested in another point of view, though their point of view is often extremely limited. They won't learn because they won't listen. There's this spiritual apathy there. It's a stagnation that occurs. They are dull of hearing. And we know in the Christian life we are supposed to be quick to listen, slow to speak as believers. Uh, The writer will tell us later on in chapter 13, I urge you to submit to your spiritual leaders so that that is not a burden to them for they watch over your souls. And so a mature believer is quick to listen, but not these folks. The, The writer goes on in chapter five, verse 12 to say, in fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. 
And here the writer begins to use a metaphor for human development in order to describe spiritual conditions. They have regressed back to a state of immaturity. They have an arrested development. And they are are like spiritual toddlers who still drink milk rather than solid food. They are spiritual babes. How many of you know age alone does not necessarily produce maturity? I remember back when I worked at UPS in grad school. Uh, UPS is a a union outfit, and so all promotions, all all elevations of position were always based on seniority, only seniority. There was never any merit-based promotion there at UPS whatsoever. Didn't matter how hard you worked, that didn't matter. What mattered is how much time do you have in. That is not the way it works in the Christian life. It does not necessarily matter how much time you have in. It is not necessarily the case that because you've been a Christian for this long, you will necessarily be a mature believer. So that's the next observation. Uh, Milk drinkers cannot clearly and accurately communicate biblical truth. An immature believer has an extremely shallow understanding of the doctrines of the Christian faith and therefore by extension has an inability to be useful in instructing others about what they believe. They should have been teachers, but yet they still need to be students again. And so they are of little use to the church. I heard about a high school teacher one time who didn't get a promotion, and that teacher was passed over by a younger uh, teacher, and uh, the the, the older, more seasoned teacher went to the principal and says, "I, I don't understand why you're passing me over. I have 25 years of teaching experience at this school, and you're overlooking me in favor of this younger teacher, but the principal said, well, in my opinion, you really don't have 25 years of experience at this school. You have one year of experience that you have repeated 25 times in a row. Just like that, sometimes there can be Christians who do not take advantage of their time in to grow in their spiritual maturity. And so that leads us to point number three. A milk drinker simply cannot feed themselves from the Word of God. This is how it is with babies. I have nothing against babies. We've had three babies in our household. It's been a great blessing. Babies are cute. Babies are beautiful. Babies are joyful. Babies drink milk. Babies should drink milk. Milk is good for babies. In fact, that's what many of our moms here uh, today have done for our families. They have nourished them and strengthened them and, and, and with patience and tender care uh, fed them because milk is good for a baby. But after time passes... If somebody stays a baby, and stays a baby, and stays a baby, and stays a baby, there's something wrong and tragic there. Moms, you know what that's like when you have to treat a nine-year-old as if they're acting like a two-year-old because that's how they're behaving. That's no fun, right? A teenager still drinking from a bottle is really weird. (laughs) These are the jokes, folks. Once you mature... (laughs) You should be able to feed yourself. A mature person can not only learn to feed themselves, but they can feed others. I'm sad for you if you you come to church each Sunday and you're kind of riding on the pastor's coattails because this is the only time you open up your Bible all week. That's like eating once a week. A spiritually mature person needs to nourish themselves every day. They know how to feed themselves from the Word of God, and they can also feed others from the Word of God as well. That's a mark of spiritual maturity. How are we doing here? Once you're mature, you begin to go to the Word and feed yourself. Verse 13, anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. Now, personally, I believe the teaching about righteousness here is referring to the law of God, first of all, kept perfectly by Jesus Christ on our behalf as he gave us his righteousness. That is the gospel. We focused an entire message last week on that magnificent truth that we get imputed with the king's righteousness, and that is our great high priest. That is the king priest who has given us that great gift. But secondly, our response to that gospel is to pursue keeping the king's law out of gratitude and out of love for him. This is important, otherwise we slip into a heresy called antinomianism or license to sin, which is foreign to the New Testament scriptures. Sometimes you see believers even acting like the law of God is a bad thing, as if law and grace are totally opposed to one another. That's a very spiritually immature way to think about the teaching about righteousness. Remember, King David said, oh, how I love your law. Now, 
some parts of the law, the ceremonial law in particular, we know all pointed towards the Messiah, the Savior. Those have been fulfilled, and therefore those ceremonial aspects of the law are obsolete now. But there are other aspects of the law, God's moral law as expressed in the Ten Commandments and other ethical places that we are to follow as our guide for moral living as well. We love the law, and the reason is because our Lord Jesus loves the law. And if we love Jesus, we love what he loves. I'll give you an example from home. My wife, Julie, loves teeth. She is a hygienist. And so there's a big emphasis on teeth in our home. There's flossing. There's electric toothbrushes everywhere. There's water picks that sound like jackhammers at night that are going on. We have, uh, you know, obviously all kinds of little mouth models all around the house. Every tooth has a different number. We all know about this in our household because the mother in our family loves teeth. She makes sure that our children take good care of their teeth as well. She's still working on her husband. But in our house, we love teeth. Now, before I met Julie, can I be, just be honest with you? I never really thought that much about teeth. I just really just didn't. But now that we are married, I love my wife, Julie, so now I love teeth too. I have now taken an interest in teeth. Why? Because she loves teeth. Friends, my point in that sort of silly illustration is that I love Jesus, you love Jesus, Jesus loves the law. Therefore, you should love the law. Amen. This is Jesus' righteous standards for living. This is the teaching about righteousness. Those who are spiritually immature do not have that perspective about the law. Verse 14. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. This is the characteristic that we call discernment. An immature believer does not have discernment. They cannot discern what is right from what is wrong. They are blown about with the wind, we saw this in week one. They are drifting. Remember, if you are not moving forward, there is no standing still in the Christian life. They are drifting away because they do not have this foundation. So these folks, they're not doctrinally discerning. They just go along with fads. They are often emotionally very gullible. They just go along with our culture. Whatever our culture thinks is right, whatever our culture thinks is wrong, that's how they're guided. That is their moral compass. Rather than looking to the word of God to distinguish good from evil. And so that's the fourth characteristic of an immature believer. A milk drinker is very undiscerning. I heard a great quote about discernment this week. Quote, discernment is the ability to see the truth in the midst of the deception. Discernment is the ability to see the truth in the midst of the deception. But these folks are often not concerned about that. They're personality followers. They, they love to be taken in by more charismatic personalities. But that's not good. If we do that, we can begin to condone things that God condemns, and we can actually resent things that God approves. We must be discerning. Finally, notice here it says in verse 14 that by constant use, they distinguish good from evil. By constant practice, your translation might say, they are putting their faith into practice, which is the fifth characteristic of spiritual immaturity. Milk drinkers do not put their faith into practice. There's no good works, there's no action, there's no real fruit in their lives, there's no real act of obedience. One of the great joys of our lives as uh, husband and wife is the Lord has given us three kids and we're just really blessed. We have a fun time together, especially when they were little. I remember when they were small, I used to play this game with, with them called Follow the Leader. You remember that game, Follow the Leader. There's a leader and you walk around behind the leader and you have to do whatever the leader does. I remember I used to play that game with them all the time, especially at the morning bus stop. As we were waiting for the bus to come, uh, we would play a little game, follow the leader. So they were small and they were doing whatever daddy did. So, you know, I try to hop on one foot and they're, they're, they're following, they're hopping on one foot, I try to flap my arms, things that are not too uh, exhausting, you know. So follow the leader, we're doing this thing. And then when one of them would, would uh, beat the other one, one of them wouldn't do it right, they got really upset. Like, oh man, I didn't do it, I'm, I'm out, I'm out. They were like crystal clear about the nature and purpose of that game, follow the leader. They understood that the nature of that game was to imitate the leader 
in a perfect fashion. Otherwise, they had missed the point of the game. They were totally clear about that, crystal clear about the purpose of follow the leader. And I was thinking about that game. And I was thinking, what if we got that intense with the, the game following our leader, the Lord Jesus? It seems like we play follow the leader with the Lord Jesus a little differently. Like, when we play follow the leader with Jesus, we think, I know Jesus says to do this and I'm supposed to do this, but right now I'm just thinking about following him in my mind. I know Jesus said to do this, but I'm just kind of thinking about following him with my heart. I'm just memorizing what he said about following him. I'm not actually following him. I, maybe I'll follow him in that way later in the future. I'm planning on it. I don't think that's actually how the game is supposed to work. I don't think that's the mark of spiritual maturity. Instead, real faith would show itself in my action. James says that faith without works of this kind is really a dead kind of faith. And so the milk triggers, we see, they don't really listen. They can't really clearly communicate accurately biblical truth. They, they cannot feed themselves from the word of God. They are very undiscerning, and they do not put their faith into practice. How are you doing? If on a scale of five, you had to rate yourself on each of those characteristics, five being you're really doing great on this, one being you're not even on the scale, how are you doing so far with this spiritual maturity rubric that the book of Hebrews is giving us today? Can I be honest with you? There was a time in my life where I was not doing any of those things. Extremely spiritually immature in my adulthood. Not really paying attention to any of those marks of maturity. Around that time, I had met my wife, my wonderful in-laws, began to see what the spiritual life could really look like, and the Lord, through his mercy and grace, completely, completely, thank God, changed my life around. How are you doing? Let's look at the second category of people, the meat eaters. We find these people in chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. The author begins chapter 6 by saying, therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and and be taken forward to maturity, not laying again the, 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 the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and of faith in God, instruction about cleansing rites, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And God permitting, we will do so. The elementary teachings he's referring to may be either the foundational aspects of Judaism or the basics of Christianity. Scholars are divided on that. We're not really sure. My leaning, because of verse 2 where it says the cleansing rites, is he's talking about the, the ceremonial washings they had in Judaism. And so uh, my thought is that Christianity is built on top of Judaism, on top of that foundation. Now, it's not that we abandon those doctrines of Judaism. They were right and true, and they had their time. But we are to build on top of them now. Christianity is built on top of the Jewish scriptures. They were like the ABCs of the faith, but now we cannot simply just learn our ABCs and we're done. We must now take those letters and begin to form words and begin to form sentences and begin to form paragraphs and begin to write God's story that he is writing in us for his glory and move on toward maturity. Notice that word, maturity, there. You might say, well, what is maturity? Simply put, I would say it's the opposite of everything we've just said about Spiritual immaturity. It means rather than not listening well, we do listen well. It means rather than not being able to feed ourselves, we do feed ourselves. And rather than not communicating biblical truth, we can communicate biblical truth. Uh, fourthly, rather than being undiscerning, we become discerning. Rather than not putting our faith into practice, we put our faith into practice. We pursue maturity. Now, that doesn't mean we're perfect. Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, I have not already obtained perfection. That's not possible in this life, but we should be pressing forward. Notice the beginning of verse 1. Let us move beyond. Your Bible might say, let us go on. That little phrase sticks in my mind as one of the central commands of the book of Hebrews. Let us move beyond. Let us go on. And it reminds me of a story that the author has been weaving through this book, the story of the Exodus. 
You'll recall that God had saved his people from Egypt and that he had redeemed them with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. And then they came to that season in the wilderness. And then they went up to go spy out the land to see if they were ready to take the land. They brought back fruit from the land and 12 spies went up to the land. And then 10 of them came back and said, we're never gonna be able to take this land. There's giants there. We're like grasshoppers in our own sight. We can't do this. Let's not do this. But two spies came back, Joshua and Caleb, And they said, no, 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 the Lord did not bring us this far to abandon us now. You remember the 10 plagues? You remember the Red Sea? You see the manna? You see the quail? You see how God has been providing for us every step of the way? I don't know how it's going to work out, but by faith, by faith, we can do this. And Numbers chapter 13, Caleb steps forward and says, let us go up to the land. Let us go up to the land. Let us go up to the land. And here, I think the writer to the Hebrews is like a first century Caleb saying, I know there's opposition. I know this is difficult. I know we're getting persecuted, but let us move beyond. Let us go on towards spiritual maturity. Let us go up to all that God has for us and all of his promised rest. I don't want to miss out on one thing God has for me in this life. Let us go up. By faith, we can take it. Friends, the Christian life is a journey, and we must fix our eyes on Jesus on this journey. But can I say this one sentence with all seriousness? We must keep going, or we are not going to make it. Allow me to mention a danger. There is a teaching out there, Jen Wilkin brings about this problem, that's called celebratory failureism. What in the world is that? It is a defeatist attitude, a perspective on the way we live the Christian life. There is a way of thinking that failure in the Christian life is almost something worth celebrating. That none of us can obey God's standards and all we can do is fall short and repent and we do this for the rest of our lives with no thought of any victory over sin whatsoever in the Christian life. Now, I know we all fall short and I know we need to be repenting daily, but there is this strange conversation out there, folks. If you haven't run across it, you probably will soon, that we should almost be glad about breaking God's law because it magnifies God's mercy and grace. Romans chapter six says, may it never be. Friends, that's not quite right. Now, I know why people value God's grace. And sometimes it's because they came out of a a culture of legalism that didn't have a proper view of God's mercy. And there's a place for that correction. But this is an overcorrection. This is a thinking that sometimes obedience kind of gets missing or almost like obedience or holiness are like bad words. That's not quite right. Now, I love the doctrines of grace. I love the doctrine of justification. Last week, if you were here for Hebrews 4 and 5, my heart was soaring as we talked about the work of our great high priest on our behalf and this amazing sacrifice and atonement that he has made for us by his mercy. That is an amazing truth of God, and we need to proclaim that message of grace for the world. However, there should also be a positive moving forward in the Christian life, and we should pursue this. Friends, We should not reduce the gospel to only the news of justification. Justification is good news. Sanctification is also good news. You might say, how is that good news? Well, let me let Jen Wilkins say it because she says it better than I could. Justification is the good news that by faith, you don't have to pay the penalty of your sin. Wow, unbelievable. Go back and listen to last week's message if you missed that. But sanctification, she said, is the good news that you don't have to live in your sin anymore. That's good news too. The mature person understands that. I recall I had a professor at DTS, Dr. J. Dwight Pentecost. When I enrolled, he was 88. I I thought, I better take this guy because I I don't know. (laughs) He ended up teaching until 99. Uh, I had plenty of time. But so he was teaching Hebrews. And I actually just, I have so much respect for him. I went up and I said, Dr. P, I'm, I'm a little confused about the Christian life and victory. Can we really experience victory in the Christian life? This is like an 89-year-old man. 
And he said, yes, moment by moment. Yes, moment by moment. I will never forget that answer. Yes, you can. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you, and every point in your life you have a fork in the road and a choice to either pursue the life of faith or not. Yes, moment by moment. You won't obtain perfection, but true victory is possible. Sanctification is good news. For the milk drinker, they don't understand that. For the milk drinker, like, Jesus is a part of their life next to a bunch of other parts of their life. For the meat eater, Jesus is the most important thing in their life. He plays an absolutely central role. Everything about their life revolves around glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ. They want him to like live through them. They want to die so that he can live. Christ really is their all. So this is the pursuit of maturity. And friends, I'll say it again. We must keep moving toward maturity or we will not make it to our final destination. Which leads us to movement three. The mask wearers. Now these next few verses of chapter six have caused many Christians throughout the centuries no small amount of stress. There is no small amount of commentaries and articles and debates and views on this. If you want, we can talk. I have all the seven views listed. We'll, you know, we'll talk for a long time. There's a lot of uh, work that goes into just understanding these three verses, but I think if you understand them properly today, they will take on a very easy to understand explanation. So let's just look very carefully with our ears. Let's listen very carefully to what it says. The writer says, verse four, it is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who've tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age and who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance, to their loss. They're crucifying the son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. And so here we have this somber warning. The word fall away there, peripipto, is only used one time in the entire New Testament. You have to search classical Greek literature to find out the definition. And when you do, you find out it means either to fall back, to fall alongside, to go astray, to get lost, or fall into a severe error. It is a forsaking. It is a turning away. This is not a passive act. It is a deliberate repudiation of the faith. It is something you decide to do. You're not going to do this by accident. Notice the text of Hebrews says, if you do that though, it will be impossible for you to be restored again. Verse six says, when you do that, just like pursuing the system of Judaism puts you back in the camp of those who are under God's judgment in the first century and the temple will be destroyed just as Jesus predicted, you are like crucifying the Son of God with them all over again and receiving the same judgment that Jesus pronounced on them. This is a, it, it, this is, this is a somber warning about not becoming an enemy of the cross. And spiritually speaking, the word for this is called apostasy. Apostasy is a real and somber and sobering, scary issue in the Bible. Now, don't misunderstand. An apostate is not just a non-Christian. An apostate is not just a struggling Christian. An apostate is someone who seemed to be a believer was part of Christ's visible church, participated in the community of faith, but then later rejects Christ, turns away from sound teaching, and leaves the church. These individuals do not reject Christ ignorantly. They do so knowingly and willfully. And their judgment is severe. And so this text yields a lot of questions, two of them being, what kind of person is described here as falling away? And number two, are you telling me here that, you know, Someone could lose their salvation? What's going on here? Well, the answer to that second question, I believe, is simply no. And the reason is we interpret unclear scriptures with clear scriptures, and so many other scriptures tell us in plain language, Philippians 1, 6, he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. John chapter 10, no one can ever snatch you out of my hand. Or Paul says in Romans chapter 8, those 
who he predestined, he also called. Those who he called, he also justified. Those who he justified, he also glorified. This is called the golden chain of redemption. The same ones who begin are the same ones who end. Jesus loses none. All God's children, God preserves. No one who is a true believer will ever fully fall away from Jesus. So then going back to the Hebrews passage, how do we understand warnings like this in the scriptures which seem to threaten judgment, eternal judgment for those who fall away? Well, some people say, well, maybe this isn't really talking about salvation. I'm not sure that's convincing based on something he says in verse 9. And my opinion on this passage in Hebrews chapter 6 is though others may disagree, these are not true believers. They're apostate. These are individuals who were affiliated with the early church, who did attend services, who were mixed in, but some of them did not have a genuine relationship with our Lord. They didn't have a real saving faith that endures. You recall when the group came out of Egypt and God called his people, there was a description of that group of people that is called the rabble, or or some translations say it's a mixed multitude. Some of them were believers, some of them were not believers. In the same way, I think in every church, in this church, in every church, there is always a mixture of wheat and tares. And so the author, in needing to speak a word to the tares, has to speak to the entire group. Because sometimes it's unclear. It's unclear. So don't be surprised that verses 4 through 6 here sound and look like a believer. That's the whole point. They seemed like they were believers, but turned out not to be believers. Look at the fivefold description here. Verse 4, they were once enlightened. They received some sort of knowledge about God's truth. Second, they tasted the heavenly gift. They experienced the blessings of God and his community, maybe referring there to the Lord's Supper. They shared in the Holy Spirit. They were among the group who received the Holy Spirit. They they tasted the goodness of the Word of God. They sat under the teaching of the Word of God. And lastly, they they were experiencing the powers of the coming age. They saw the miraculous signs and wonders of the apostles. There is a way to be a part of God's gathered people, but only be there externally, not internally. You can enjoy the privileges of being part of the community of faith, but still not actually be saved. This is why this is such a sober warning. Now, the passage, if you're not feeling slightly uh, some tension here, then you're not really reading it correctly. It's, It's hard to understand because there's both a warning going on And we understand that there's incredible promises from God. And so we we must ask, how do these warnings relate to the promises that God has given his people? How do they work together, warnings and promises? Well, Dr. Tom Schreiner is helpful here. He says, the warnings are the means that God uses to keep his people to the end. The warnings are the means God uses to keep his people to the end. The warnings are effective to keep keep us in the family of God, like, like prodding cattle. Stay with the group. Now, I know this is hard to understand, but I want to try to give you an earthly illustration to see if you can understand this spiritual truth. In Acts chapter 27, there's a story of a shipwreck. There's a big storm. Paul's on this ship. Uh, He's he's headed to Rome as a prisoner. Uh, He he was a missionary, and and all of a sudden, this furious squall comes up, and everybody's going to die, and an angel comes to Paul. And, And let me put the verse on the screen. It says in Acts 27, verse 23, Paul says, last night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said, God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. Did you see the promise there on the screen? Every single person, all 276 passengers on this ship are going to survive. That is a promise from this angel from God himself. I want you to see that promise as analogous in a way to the promises that God has given us of salvation. A little time passes after the angel visits, and some of the sailors in the middle of the storm don't believe Paul. They get scared, and they start trying to escape the ship. They find like a lifeboat on the ship, and they're like letting themselves down privately in a lifeboat. And Paul spots them from across the ship and talks to the captain, the centurion, and it says this in verse 31. Then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. 
If you allow the sailors to do this, Paul says, we're not going to live. Notice how this passage works. Paul gives them a warning that if he allows them to do that, they won't survive, but he's already given them a promise that they will survive, and the warning is the means by which the promise will come to pass. The warnings of Scripture work like that. Spiritually, the warnings of the Bible are the means that God uses to keep his people to the end. It is a loving thing to issue a warning. It is Mother's Day. How many of you moms know what it means to issue a warning to your children? You know how warnings work. If a mom gives a warning, that doesn't contradict the incredible motherly love that she has for her child. That doesn't contradict any of her promises either. If a mom says, I promise to protect you, my child, and to keep you safe, and then in the next breath says, do not go out in the street, that is not an unloving thing for the mother to say. That is a warning and the means by which the child is going to be kept safe under her care. Spiritually speaking, the warnings of the Bible work just like that. Now, the obvious question is, well, Pastor Dave, what if somebody doesn't heed the warning? What if somebody does fall away? And the answer here is that they are apostate. They are not people who have lost their salvation. They are people who never had a saving relationship with the Lord to begin with. 1 John chapter 2 makes this really clear. Check out this tongue twister. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might be plain that they are not of us. This text is a sobering reminder that there are people in churches who seem to be true believers, but are not. And our Lord Jesus gave us a similar warning. You'll recall at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord saying, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, next slide please, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. Some have said that's the scariest verse in the whole Bible. Who is this? We don't know. Only God knows. It's important that we not take on the role of God here. Our job is not to know who these people are. It only becomes clear after they reject Christ and leave who they are. Our job is to examine our own hearts. 2 Corinthians 13 does not say, examine your neighbor and test them to see if they're in the faith. It says, examine yourselves and test yourselves to see if you're in the faith. If you're listening to a message like this and you keep thinking of your neighbor or you keep thinking of someone else, you're reading it wrong. In fact, that's a dead giveaway that you should be thinking about yourself. The warnings are for believers who have ears to hear. And so we must examine ourselves. We do this every time we take the Lord's Supper, examine ourselves. We examine our lives. We look for spiritual fruit and real, real spiritual progress and evidence that the Holy Spirit is at work. And so the author actually gives us a helpful illustration from agriculture. Verse 7, he says, Land that drinks in the rain, often falling on it, and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is farmed, receives the blessing of God. But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed in the end, it will be burned. Let me ask you a question. Do you find thistles on fig trees? No, of course not, Pastor Dave. I'm not a farmer. I'm not an agricultural person. But everybody knows you don't find thistles on fig trees. Okay, another question. Do you find figs on thorn bushes? No, Pastor Dave, that's so ridiculous. Everybody knows you don't. You don't find figs on thorn bushes and you do not find thistles on fig trees. I mean, to say that would be possible is crazy. Anybody who says that, anybody who tells you that, mark it down, that person is either a complete looney tune or, you know what, they're lying. All right, you're a Christian, right? Why does your life look like that? Why the thorns and the thistles? Why all the lacking 
of spiritual fruit, the author says. How do I know if I'm in danger? Two questions. First, me. How do I know if I'm in danger? Secondly, what about those that I love and have stopped, though, and they've wandered away? Let's address ourselves first. How do I know if this is me? Answer, look for the warnings. If your life lacks fruit and there is only thorns and thistles, what that means is your life is producing sin and you're not producing the fruit of the Spirit. The author says that's a warning. Now, I know none of us does this perfectly. But if that's all I produce, thorns and thistles, that's a warning. Or if I quit because it's just too difficult, that's a warning. If you say, I just need a break from serving God. I can't take it anymore. The Christian life is too hard. That's a warning. If you do not keep going on your journey with Jesus, you will not make it to your destination. If your attitude is, Pastor Dave, tell me the minimum I need to know to get my insurance, to get my ticket to heaven, and that's all I need to know, if you have no interest in growing in the faith or your knowledge of God, that's a warning. Please listen. I do not like being hard. I do not like being harsh. Last week when we were in Hebrews 4 and 5, I was soaring with the good news of God's grace. I love to proclaim the good news of the gospel. This kind of message is like number 576 on my list of top messages I enjoy giving. But I would not be being faithful as a pastor if I did not communicate with you accurately what God's word has to say. The book of Hebrews is like intense pastoral counseling. This letter is intensely pastoral. I know there's a lot of theology, but this author cares deeply about his audience. It's like public counseling. Remember chapter 13, verse 22, the author calls this a word of exhortation. A word of exhortation. In the, in the Greek, that word actually is the word parakaleo, which has two parts. Para means to come alongside, like a parable. You throw a story along the side. A para means to come alongside. That's what a good counselor does. They come alongside of you in your difficulty, and they walk with you, and they are for you. And that, we need that. We need That's the ministry of mercy. We need that from God's word. We need that from spiritual leaders to help people through difficult situations. Come alongside. The second part of the word is kaleo. You know what it means? To yell. It means to yell at somebody, like to warn them to give a word of caution, and that's also what a good, spiritually mature counselor will do also. And so you see these two words mashed together. This is what good Christian counseling is. It is a mixture of both of these things. This is what Hebrews is. This is why the book of Hebrews seems to me like schizophrenic at times. You have some passages, passages like last week that are so comforting, and then you have some passages like this week that are so harsh. And sometimes we need both. It's harsh and it's compassionate. And, and sometimes the people are suffering and they need comfort, yet also other times the people are in danger of making a terrible choice and they need a warning. Last week was one of those messages where we received comfort. Today is one of those messages where you feel like you're getting yelled at the whole time. The warning that the writer is giving here is that those who are milk drinkers and those who are mask wearers can sometimes look the same. In other words, if someone remains a milk drinker and stays a baby and stays a baby and stays a baby, that's a warning, that's a chance that that person is actually not a true believer in the first place. And so the exhortation is to press on and prove that you are not a mask wearer. And so that's how we handle the exhortation for our own hearts. Second question, what about the people I love? A friend or a child or a grandchild that used to follow Jesus but no longer does, what about them? Now, one of the hardest things about this passage is for, for me is that names come to mind. Like faces come to mind. Real people come to mind. And I'd love to tell you that if they prayed their prayer when they were four years old, that they're going to be just fine. 
but that would not be being honest with the scriptures. The scriptures are really clear that those whom God calls persevere with enduring faith and it's active and they begin this pursuit of spiritual maturity that carries on to completion on the day of Christ Jesus. And so for our loved ones that seem to have wandered away, we pray and we warn and we leave them into God's hands knowing that the judge of all the earth will do what is right. Which brings me to you. Now, it could be that the Spirit of God has aligned this text today because someone needs a warning. Or maybe you're watching today and you need this warning. Can I say, please, if that's you, listen. The writer here is so desperate that his church does not go down this road. He's begging them. And so let me just ask you personally, where are you in your faith journey today? Are you really a friend of Narnia? Before you answer too quickly, I wonder, would other people put you in that category? Would you want to know what they would have to say? Would you please listen to the exhortation in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 15, today, while it is still called today, do not harden your heart. Come back to God. Amen. The hymn writer says, the Savior is waiting to enter your heart, why don't you let him come in? There's nothing in this world to keep you apart. What is your answer to him? Time after time, he has waited before, and now he is waiting again to see if you're willing to open the door. Oh, how he wants to come in. And so, if that's you today, if you hear his voice, open the door. Now, for the rest of us. For the vast majority of people in a congregation like this and those who would choose to tune in to watch today, I want you to receive this encouragement at the end of this passage. Verse nine. Even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are convinced of better things in your case, the things that have to do with salvation. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you helped his people and continue to help them. This is the only time the author uses that phrase, dear friends. Your Bible might say, beloved. The author is encouraged by what he already sees in the vast majority of his audience here. And he points out three critical areas of fruitfulness. First, their labors in the ministry. God will not forget your work, your good deeds. Second, their affection for God, the work you're doing, you're doing it as to the Lord. You're working unto him. I see that. Third, you've helped his people. You're serving the saints. God is watching you. This is all evidence that your faith is real. Your faith is genuine. You are the real deal. And so he concludes this passage by saying, just keep on moving forward. Just keep on pressing in. Verse 11, we want each of you to show this same diligence to the very end so that what you hope for may be fully realized. We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. Amen. How encouraging. Continue to be diligent, make every effort, be serious about your faith, be earnest till the end, be intentional about your relationship with the Lord. Secondly, be hardworking for your faith so that you might not be lazy or sluggish like those others and be patient in your faith. Be imitators of those who through, through, through faith and patience inherit God's promises. Those promises are for you. Keep on going forward, brother. Keep on moving forward, sister. This is the vast majority of us here, I believe. You are on this journey and you have not given up. You are going to make it because you see this kind of fruit manifesting in your life. God is at work in and through you, and he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. Beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you, things that accompany your salvation. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray together as the worship team comes to lead us in song. Heavenly Father, Thank you for preserving this warning, though it's difficult to hear. And God, I'm just gonna ask you to do something that only you can do now. Because only you know who's listening or here or watching. Only you know who needs to be warned. And only you know the difference between those who need to be warned and those who need this encouragement. 
And as a mere human being, I cannot make that differentiation. So spirit of the living God, would you please make that differentiation yourself? With every head bowed, every eye closed, personally, as you think about your own relationship with the Lord, is there anybody here today who's just been drinking milk, who might even be dangerously close to looking like someone who would fall away? If there's anybody in the room like this, would you just take a moment and recommit to pursuing maturity with God today? Just say, God, I know I need to come back on this path of spiritual maturity. Let me encourage you as one of your pastors. Let me encourage you to come back. We love you. God loves you. And dear Lord, I just pray for those here today who are struggling. And maybe even feel alone. Who feel like maybe nobody else really knows what they're, they're going through. Help us as fellow believers to come alongside one another and encourage one another. And exhort one another toward love and good deeds. Help us to see how we can help those who need to come back into the fold of God and those who need to pursue maturity and those who need to pursue you and make you the very center of our lives. God, would you bind our wandering hearts to you? I pray for our body here today in this service that these folks, Lord, would be people known for pursuing you with all of their heart, all of their mind, all of their soul, all of their strength, for you are all to us, Lord. We love you and we worship you. We want our lives to reflect you. For the glory of your beautiful name we pray. Amen.